L. So I assume I'm going to be led in over here soon. Yeah, so that will be our indicator that we're live. Okay, but I'm not in yet. Oh, we're now broadcasting. We're live. Okay, share screen. Yep, go for it. Just waiting for attendees to come in. Hello, hello, folks. Welcome, welcome. We're just getting ourselves warmed up, making sure everything functions, making sure everybody's coming in. Maybe turning off additional microphones and volumes. There we go. Perfect. The question is, is that picking up that one? <laughs> Problem solved. Pardon us. <laughs> we have a lot of technology around here. <laughs> Gee, it's almost like we do with robots and other bits of weird technology. Yes. Okay. So, shall we start? Yes, let's shall. Okay. Well, welcome to uh, you know, Balticon 54 and welcome to our presentation, Testing the Robots that Keep Us Safe. Also, so. welcome to the first virtual Balticon because, you know, the fact that uh, we've pulled all of this together in a very short period of time is truly awesome. Uh, Balticon usually takes two years to plan. Instead, it's got two months. So this is pretty awesome. Cool. Okay, so I'm Raymond Shea. I'm a uh, research professor at Georgetown University and a guest researcher at NIST uh, here in Gaithersburg. Um, a lot of the work that uh, we'll be talking about I did while I was a senior lecturer at Curtin University in Western Australia. And I'm Archer Lowsley. Uh, I am a, a compulsive volunteer and that means that uh, I am an educator that teaches whatever needs teaching. So it might be that I'm helping kids with their robots or for Balticon, uh, virtual Balticon, being the Zoom Wrangler and teaching all the techs how to do the thing. So welcome, it's all my fault. <laughs> so, so shall we proceed? Yes, please. Okay, so we're talking about robots, but what robots are we actually talking about? So the robots that keep us safe that I'm referring to are Robots such as these, they're robots that go into environments that we don't want to go into to perform tasks that are too dangerous. These might be robots that are going into you know, a collapsed building to find survivors. They might be robots that are tasked with approaching suspicious packages to tell whether further action needs to be taken. These are robots that are going into areas of biological, radiological or um, chemical hazard in order to address the situation. Or there might be robots that are simply getting to places like drones that humans can't get to safely, even if it's performing a fairly simple task. We call these response robots. They're responding uh, to a particular situation. Now, the question that we're posing here is, how do we test the performance of these robots to make sure that when the people who need them need them to perform, that they will perform? And how do we form a competition around this that can involve students at high school and college level in order to also foster the next generation. So, of course, we're talking about testing. What do we mean by testing? Well, you're familiar with tests, okay? You know, think about your average game of, um, you know, I think around here you have a game, I, th I think it's called football. It, it yeah. always strikes me as being more appropriately called hand egg, but let's, let's call it football, right? I mean, when a football coach is looking for new players, they don't just make them play the game over and over and over again to see who to bring in, right? You have uh, the scouting combine, you have standard tests, running, jumping, catching, throwing, that the coach understands means certain things in the game and means certain things for different positions. These tests, are simple enough and well known enough that new players can also perform these tests you know, in their own facilities and know what they need to do, right? And of course, there are some fairly standard tests, running, jumping, catching, throwing. I guess there's sort of some less useful ones. I guess, you know, trombone stomping might be one. Wait, trombone stomping? Yeah, apparently it was a very important part of uh, one of your seminal games in 1982 between uh, Cal and Stanford. I don't think we're actually testing for that oh, standard. Okay, never mind. Anyway, moving right along, 
what would be the, how do we develop the equivalent for response robots? That is, how do we develop ways of testing the very different types of tasks that they need to perform? And, you know, I won't dwell too much on this, but basically this is all end user driven. We have the responders, we have scientists, we have researchers, we have developers, we have the manufacturers, all get together, figure out all the different tasks, all the different scenarios that a particular type of responder needs to perform. These then get broken down into elemental tests, right? Just like uh, a quarterback, you know, they need to perform, you know, they might need to run, they, I don't think a quarterback kicks, do they? I have no I idea. Know, I have no idea either. But you know, the basically different positions in the game require different skills, just like different robots for different tasks require different skills. We figure out what those are. We develop these tests. We validate them against the game such as it is. We bring them to the training sites where you have the rubble piles, you have the burn buildings, and we test to make sure that these tests that we've developed are representative we gather lots of data and we publish them. What about trombones? Um, yeah, I don't, we, I don't think we've ever actually tested a trombone. I mean, I guess it's relevant if you're the Mythbusters and you, you put explosive in, explosives into your trombone, um, but we haven't had a visit from the Mythbusters yet. So I don't think we have that problem. I will leave it to you guys. Yes. The little ones, no, I'm not, I'm yeah, not allowing the high schoolers to that. play with trombones <laughs> or explosives. I'm not sure which yeah. one's more dangerous. Anyway, so, and of course, we, we keep cycling through the responders to make sure they're relevant. But critically for what we're doing here, we also have a very, very strong involvement with the researchers, including students from high school right through to PhD students. The key thing here is it's exactly the same tests that the firefighters, the police officers, the hazmat teams are using. They're the same tests that the students are using. So the idea is, is that the students know, oh, the robots that are actually performing out in the field get these results, I'm getting these results. Just like when you're playing the game, you know that uh, you know, the professional players are getting these results. You know, the, the, the young child who's trying to train up or, the, or, or, or so on knows where the benchmark is. Although as we'll see later, this is one of those interesting cases where the students can actually be outperforming what the professionals do. So we're going to be focusing on competitions. You know, these competitions are research competitions, right? There are many different types of robotics competitions. Some of them are abstract games, which are amazingly good at encouraging the, you know, the study of science. They can be tailored to you know, cater to things like, to, to, to push things like professionalism, you know, writing, teamwork. all that teamwork, all of those things. And they're amazing for that. We're talking about competitions that are a little bit different. We're talking about competitions that actually put real world challenges in front of the students. Because they're real world challenges, they're not quite as focused towards the teaching. They're not quite as focused towards all of those, those things. But the idea is, is that you get statistical significance in your measurement of the capabilities that the students are producing. And that these capabilities, these best in class capabilities are directly answering open needs, okay? So we'll be focusing on a competition called RoboCup Rescue for time constraints. We've also been heavily involved with a competition you may be familiar with called the DARPA Robotics Challenge, among many others. So launching into it, the RoboCup Rescue Robot League, as we call it, I like to think, I mean, sometimes I describe it as being a bit like golf, right? It's not you head to head against someone else like you would have in a game of basketball or in a game of hand egg. Um, you're both working against the course. Now, one person may get a higher score than the other, but you're working against the course. What about the golf carts? Um, well, I guess if you want to play bumper cars with them as well, you could. Then you're working <laughs> against them. We're not, we don't tend to be playing bumper cars with the robots, so that's less of an issue. And so the idea is, is that we're a league of teams with one goal being to develop and demonstrate advanced robotic capabilities for emergency responders. The arena, the field we play in, looks a bit like this. It looks, it, it's supposed to represent um, a selection of challenges that robots may face. These are based on standardized tests that we've developed that are common to what we use for the emergency responders. 
And you can see we've got a car right in the middle of it. So yep. that should give you an idea of scale. So we can, we have all kinds of tests. Mm -hmm. For example, we test mobility. We test sensing. We test manipulation, I'll show some more later. But as Archer was, about, was talking about. Yeah, the we, car. Exactly. We have to, the idea is, is that the performance of these robots should we not be in any question with regard to their applicability to the real world. They're still performing the standard tests, but now they're doing it in a way that people can actually relate to. You actually have a car crash and some hazardous materials, you need these robots to demonstrate that they can actually do it. So the major league is operating at about a 120 centimeter scale? Yes, 1.2 meter scale. Okay, yep. so here is, here is the, major, the major such as it is. These are students from maybe, um, you know, second year of uh, university up. So I believe they were college sophomores, you know, sophomores um, up through to PhD students. Um, you know, here are the, ver the wide variety of robots. And in this scale, um, we have uh, a, a general scale of 1.2 meters, four feet in the environment, which means the robots have to be less than that to fit through the environment. Um, and we'll go through some of these in a little bit. But now, more recently, we also have a much smaller scale. So these are the junior students. So that would be RMRC versus just the regular robot rescue. RMRC, yeah, RMRC stands for the Rapidly Manufactured Robot Challenge. And the idea is that instead of having 120, we bring it down to 30 centimeters, so about a foot. And the idea is to have small, maneuverable, basically disposable robots. You can get them laser cut out of plastic. You can use a 3D printer. Uh, you could make demos in Legos. And you can see uh, how tiny they are compared to say the Telemax that it's sitting on. And that is an actual bomb squad robot. So these guys might be able to fit in an air duct. They might be able to fit into rubble. And generally the cost for them is about $500 or so. So if, you know, you have to send one into melting slag of some kind, oh well, you've lost 500 bucks and you can print off another one. <laughs> it's not a big issue. Where the big robot uh, that they're sitting on, uh, how much would that one cost? That's about a quarter million dollar robot. Um, you know, so you don't really want to be, uh, you don't really want to be sending, you know, your, your, your big robot in uh, with that much risk. The other important thing about these small robots, of course, is they're lightweight, they're easy to transport, they're easy to build, and being mostly plastic, if they do go boom, they don't add too much to the trap. So there is actually a real world need for robots at this scale with this type of construction. This isn't just a toy problem. Um, the other critical thing about this competition, because it's all 3D printed, sharing of information is a lot easier you could literally download another team's robot and print it. So uh, we actually use their documentation as a way of helping them along in their scoring. Uh, generally for competitions, it'll be all the stuff before the competition. You'll have preliminaries, then you'll have finals. This is some of the stuff that's included in the everything before competition and if I was handed a doc, one of those documents and I was able to read through it and go, okay, yeah, now I know how to build that robot. I could hand it off to a new team who has no idea and can flip through and go, aha, here's what they did wrong. Here's how they fixed it. Here's where the parts are. Here's the price list. If they could read that, understand it and build their own, then they get a good score. And that ends up being a multiplier for their preliminaries, which helps them get into the finals. We want to record to reward the fact that we're open source. We want these robots to be out there. We want them helping saving lives, even if they are tiny. Because if you think about, you know, a bomb squad unit or a police unit, fire unit, who wants to try something like this, procurement is an issue. And if they can't get a quarter million dollars, but they could find something like this useful, you know, maybe they could get $5,000 in a grant. Hey, that's 10 robots that's not bad. And then you can play with them, try them, uh, melt them. And of course, the powerful thing about this, because we're using standard tests, is that a new team isn't at a disadvantage, right? Traditionally, with a competition where the competition challenges don't change from year to year, new teams are at a disadvantage because they don't have a built-up body of knowledge 
they don't have an existing platform. By making how well a team tells other teams how to build their robot part of the scoring, a team cannot do well in the competition unless they've written a document, an open source document, that tells other teams how to build, recreate their robot. New teams can look at the performance of the robots in the previous year on the standard tests and actually pick which teams they're going to draw information from, which teams they're going to recreate and then build off. The idea is, is that no one should be performing worse than the best performing team from the previous year. And this is measurable through these standard tests. And of course, the robot it's sitting on you know, is, of course, one of the big robots. This, is, this was in Sydney. And of course, you give you some idea of the size relative to a, to a milk crate. So we got some big robots and some small robots. And that particular one came from a squad that is, that is near and dear to our hearts because those guys, uh, without their help, we wouldn't have been able to run our last competition. They came in in a pinch. They basically donated a humongous amount of their effort to help us build all of the arena. And after the challenge was done, they got the arena and now it's their practice field. And that's another thing that we've been doing is whenever we go to a new location, we basically bring the, all of the stuff that's needed, sometimes even tools, and we leave it there and we give it to them as future training materials. Yeah. And again, being standard tests, the same tests that we use in competition are now being used by the bomb squad in Sydney, the, the New South Wales uh, Police Bomb Squad, not only to, tr to train their robot operators, but they're actually running humans in bomb suits through the same apparatuses. Which was really cool to see, actually. <laughs> um, so it looks like we've got a bit of delay in the slide. Yep. I think that's okay. Yeah. The, joy, the, joy, the joys of doing uh, telewebinars. <laughs> anyway, so of course, one of the challenges is uh, rough terrain mobility, right? How well um, the robots can get over rubble and rough terrain. And of course, these are standardized because you want to be able to compare the same robot, or sorry, the different robots over the same challenge. And in this case, we construct it out of, uh, of cinder blocks of a specific size in a particular orientation. Um, sometimes we use gravel, mulch, sand, uh, bits of plastic, so you have entanglement problems. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. <laughs> and of course, it's also a lot of fun when the robots break. Yeah, that's probably the best part of the fun. So I've started a trophy wall. These are my lovely, beautiful trophies. So if you look closely, and maybe we can yep, have him come up. zoom in, uh, you can see some of our lovely little robots from the RMRC groups with all of the dead parts. Uh, we encourage our students, especially the RMRC team, to basically push to the tolerance levels. Uh, when you have a manufacturer bringing a robot out and saying, here, Bomb Squad, this is a $2 million robot. It is beautiful and wonderful and gorgeous. It is the most expensive, so obviously this is the best one. Most likely, somebody who's demoing that robot isn't going to push it past its tolerances in order to show what it can actually do in a crunch time. Our kids are definitely pushing their robots to their limits and then some. And we encourage them to bring spare parts, fix and keep going. And sometimes that also means that, hey, my arm broke off and you know, you gotta replace it. Or they broke, well, it's a one team that broke all their wheels and replaced it with milk uh, carton pieces. Yeah. How did they manage to break three raspberry pies? Well, pies are delicious, aren't they? <laughs> okay, anyway, um, but on a serious note though, this is again one of the powerful things about having a standardized test is, is that you can actually develop these uh, mean time before failure or mean time between failure measurements, something that is traditionally very hard to achieve. Okay, so moving along, um, of course, this isn't all just fun and games, right? Um, you've also got, um, you know, here, here's a story um, of how this was very applicable. Um, you know, who remembers what happened in Fukushima in Japan with the nuclear reactor several years ago? There was a hydrogen explosion and, you know, you couldn't get people into the reactor building, but they needed to inspect some of the equipment on the top floors to see if the control room should turn it on and off in order to cool the reactor and facilitate a safer shut down of the facility. Now they sent some military robots in initially that were able to open the doors, 
But the problem is they couldn't get up the stairs. Stairs, and are, they, hard. stairs are hard. And they couldn't get up the, uh, the various things they needed to. The robot that actually managed to get up the top of the stairs and facilitate this shutdown was actually a robot that was developed by one of these RoboCup rescue teams, not the juniors, it was developed by a university team and was refined over several years and so they knew exactly what the performance was in the standard test. They knew it would perform and it turned out to be critical in shutting down the reactor. And, the reactor when, you, and when you have a situation like this, you do not, have, do not have the option for failure. If a robot went partway up the stairs and then couldn't get any further and couldn't get itself down, that means that it's now an obstacle for the next robot to try and get through. So you... If you're going to send it up, you have to be guaranteed a success. Otherwise, it's going to be total failure. Yeah. Um, and actually, we do have a test facility. We help. We do help. We have helped the uh, Japan Atomic Energy Agency set up a test facility just inside the exclusion zone in Fukushima, specifically to do testing of their robots. Now, it turns out that the robot that they did send up was stopped um, by debris that had fallen over the stair. Now, of course, this competition is very responsive to what happens. So we actually now have a test for occluded stairs, for example, and we are actually having robots that, could under that can now overcome these challenges. And for the RMRC team, we're including a lot of entanglement. And basically, uh, every competition, we try a different entanglement to see how it goes. And we've got some teams that have basically figured out a way of, OK, what's going to cause a problem with, say, that type of robot? The tracks are going to get tied up and most likely they're going to pop off because of all the torque and I'm sure he could talk about the science but the big thing is is that our kids have figured out aha we know a way to basically keep it running with wheels or the approximation approximation of wheels underneath the treads and just keep going it's not going to be as maneuverable or fast or reliable but it keeps going and sometimes that's the most important part so moving along, we also have, of course, tests, not just for the mobility that we talked about. I mean, of course, we have tests for the ability of the robots to manipulate, to move things around. And in fact, as you can see, um, assuming that the uh, slide updates quickly enough, um, you know, some of these can actually reach further than humans can. You know, they have the dexterity of stack blocks, which could be for shoring up walls or shoring up ceilings or for radiation shielding, like delivering, um, delivering uh, things to survivors, radios, water bottles, first aid kits, things like that. Um, we have tests for um, sensing and autonomy. You know, building maps is a very important task for a lot of these robots. Um, and to be able to build maps that you can actually relate to objects in the environment, to figure out if there's a path through to get to a survivor, you know, to figure out where the survivor is and if there's a way of drilling a hole through a wall or through a roof to get to them, um, things like that. Um, and of course, you know, very topical now, um, the topic of drones, aerial robots. And we have a whole suite of tests for these um, that, uh, again, bring this kind of rigor to a field where you haven't really had these standard tests of performance, even given the very, very wide number of players uh, in, the, in the space. Okay. So. Let's talk a little bit more about the competition that a lot of our, um, uh, a lot of these high school students, and we're actually, one of the reasons why we're, we're hammering this a bit is because this is an international competition. We want more teams. We want more teams, <laughs> and we want more teams from North America. This is at the moment a lot of teams from Asia, from Europe. We do have some teams from, from North America, but we'd like to draw up some more interest. So of course, if you, know, you, um, if you have children who are, Part of this, if you are a high school student and you're looking at this and going, this would be really cool, you know, join us. Join us. <laughs> anyway, so you can see, you know, one of the powerful things about this is that you're not spending a lot of time waiting around for your run. We you can run a lot of robots in parallel. We get a lot of test results. And so we're at, this is one of those competitions where a team gets a chance to get statistical significance. Uh, honestly, we probably get better statistical significance than you guys do because uh, last year I think I ended up basically doing 
10 runs simultaneously every time, yeah. pretty much. So uh, over the course of three days, I had hundreds of runs. And that gives you a heck of a lot of data that... It was like 300 and something. Yeah. We had 300 statistically significant tests of these robots over the course of a week. The idea is, is that we want to remove the situation where a team with a good robot gets a bit of bad luck and is wiped out, right? That's kind of, that's not cool, I think. Yeah. Having, having been in these competitions myself, right? We want the robot that's actually the best and most reliable out there, not the one that happened to get the good luck or the bad luck. Okay, we've eliminated, you know, which robot got the good or bad draw by eliminating the head to head. Now we add statistical significance over the top of this. And again, we encourage them to repair. <laughs> yep, and try new things. Mm -hmm. And of course, we make a point to always set it up. You can see the, uh, the smaller robots are over, um, over to the left, and we set them up near the big arena so that they can see um, you know, what the big robots are doing. And we also encourage the kids to go and talk to other teams as long as the other teams aren't currently busy with stuff, but go talk, make connections, and you know, learn from each other. Because again, this is us against the arena. And the arena here is an arena. In the real world, it's all of us against rubble. So we really want everyone working together against this problem. Now, of course, once the early part, once the first half of the competition is finished, where everyone gets lots and lots of runs, we then put the arena together into a maze. And now it becomes a game. Now we don't care so much about the statistical significance. We want to make it into a game for the top X amount of teams. One of the cool things about this is we don't just say we admit the top five teams. We actually have a graph. We look for the gap in the scoring. And we say that, okay, there's a big difference between these two, these teams. That's where we put the cut. It might be at three teams going through to the finals. It might be seven teams. The idea is, is that you never just miss out on the finals, right? If you just missed out, we're putting you in the finals. It shouldn't be just a matter of that because again, to instill good understanding of statistics, we know that that difference isn't statistically significant. And the other part of the fun, as far as I'm concerned, so all these started off as just nice little zigzag lanes. Uh, when it comes to the finals, I'm not the one assembling it. I'm handing the kids drills and I'm saying, hey guys, you get to determine what your path is gonna be. You get to determine what your cable management is going to be. Okay, there's a hole in the middle. How are you getting a human in there in order to move the cables around? You get to fill that out and figure that out. And they have to work as a team, as competing teams. All the teams. Yep, all the teams who are in finals working together to assemble this monstrosity <laughs> that they then challenge each other to. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so one of the, of course, one of the cool things about this is that winning is nice. But winning isn't everything because the needs are so varied, just like there's different positions on the field. So one of the big outputs of this isn't just which robot won, but for every individual part of this, which robots were the best for each part? So, you know, we actually have these radar charts where we can plot, you know, this robot was particularly good at whatever. So for example, you can see that this robot, the one, um, in the sort of middle upper left is good at a lot of things. But you can see there's one thing where this robot on the far left, the, the far upper left, is best at. It's not good at anything else, but it's terrific at this one thing. The, don't bother trying to read the, the, num, the, the letters, that doesn't matter. But the idea is, is that yes, we have a winner. But the idea is everyone can excel at something. You can come and demonstrate cool stuff, demonstrate your niche ability, you're really, really good at this thing even if you can't win the competition. And because you're sharing it with everyone else, you get to say, okay, this is the best capability. You can all share in this and I can share in your capabilities and improve from there. And this also will be very useful for things like firefighters who have no idea what a lot of these things are, but then can look at that and go, huh, I'm in New York. There are a lot of stairs. There's a whole lot of tall, thin buildings. Which of these guys can handle stairs? <laughs> Because if you have a robot that's great at everything but stairs, that's not a good robot to spend a quarter of a million dollars on because then they'd have to be picking it up and carrying it upstairs. Not worthwhile. So 
of course, we didn't just um, you know, set the competition saying, okay, here's the thing, let's go. We seeded the competition with a couple of designs. So uh, the one on the left, um, I call the EMU Mini 2, entirely 3D printed or built with parts that you can get off the shelf or by mail order anywhere in the world. The robot on the right, I call the excessively complex six-wheeled robot. Again, same principles, but I wanted to see how complex you can make it. It's got a, what, one, two, three, four, five degree of freedom arm. I don't even remember, I built it years ago. Um, you know, it's got active suspension. It's got, you know, front and rear steering. But the idea is, is that, the, the idea is, is that how much robot can you produce using just 3D printed parts? And this was done on a cheap 3D printer from 10 years ago, right? And stuff you can get off the shelf. Now, the one on the left, the, the EMU Mini 2, we deliberately had a, had a budget of $500, including the camera, including the wireless LAN, including the onboard compute. And we open sourced it. We let all the teams um, build on this. And you know, some teams built on this, and some teams came up with a bunch of different designs. So these are all designs um, that have uh, come from this, uh, this, comp this, this initial design, I including, yes, the robot <sighs> that had to be repaired using milk cartons for its wheels. I was thinking that looked familiar. So that's Coco. Hi, yes. Coco. Yes. Um, oh. It's what happens. And of course, one of the cool things about teaching using 3D printing is it teaches the kids about design for manufacturability and real structural engineering, such as you don't make your wheels lightweight and use really thin spokes like this. Yeah, spokes are fine on bicycles because spokes on bicycles are usually made out of metal. And so they're pulling the tension evenly all across the board. There's the air cushion around it. So dynamic tension, it's a great thing. Uh, plastic, mm, not so much. Yeah, well, that's why we have cocoa. But you can also see that you know they've done really cool things like being able to reach around this. This is a test artifact, we call this the pipe star and they can actually look into all the pipes and see what's going on. And so the idea is, is can you inspect a suspicious package all around it, even if it's say in a place where you can't get to the backside of it. You know, imagine how useful a little robot like this would be to, you know, to these, to these squads. And of course, you know, we actually encourage some schools and some schools have actually been using this as part of curriculum. And of course, trying to 3D print enough robots for a class set is a bit hard. Those of you who do 3D printing, and you know what happens. Basically, you're trying to squeeze the entire object out of the nozzle of the 3D printer. Um, so we even have uh, laser cut versions. Remember, we're calling this the rapidly manufactured robot challenge. Rapid manufacturing includes laser cutting um, for roughly the same price. You can get a very similar robot, and again, you can do all the same things. And, there's, and of course, we can also deconstruct this and have challenges for parts of robots. And for instance, uh, the arm, um, this is, uh, arm is actually mounted to a much bigger robot that you can't quite see. Now, of course, this isn't just about competitions. We're all about sharing here. So we also hold teaching camps, summer schools, workshops, um, where we which, is, which is held you know, several months after the competition. The competition is very good for seeing what other teams can do but it's a little bit hard to share what the top teams are doing because they're frantically busy trying to make their robots work. I mean, what did you see during the competition? Um, not much sleep, a lot of caffeine, people ordering takeout and having it brought in and then being yelled at for having takeout containers everywhere. Yeah. Um, they're high school students, right? I mean, of course, all of this applies to the, uh, to the college students as well, of course. Yeah. I mean, I think, didn't they have to, I mean, there were people sort of sleeping on the floor and then Yes. You know, robots running over them as obstacles or something. Um, Didn't that happen? Yeah. yeah. I don't think we need to talk about that. No, there was that's stuff, okay. It was fine. It was, lots of, it was fine. <laughs> no, 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 no students were injured in, 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 this, in this thing. But the idea is, is that afterwards, we get the best in class performers to come and show everyone how they did their thing. And actually, we get everyone, to, everyone who can to bring their robots and have the best in class help them implement that on their robots. But this is also an opportunity for them to talk to the responders. We get the firefighters, we get the police officers, we get the emergency response people to come out and talk to the students. And not only that though, these responders then sit with the students as they do their activities, as they try and get their things working. It goes both ways. We want the responders to have an understanding for what's actually capable, because here's the thing. What we see time and time again is 
the robots don't have a capability that's been known to science for 30 years. We asked the manufacturers, well, why don't you have this? And they said, well, no one's asking for it. We asked the responders, why aren't you asking for this? And they say, what, huh? You know, it's the old case of things that are, you know, fairly well understood to science can often seem to be science fiction to those who don't know about it. And of course, things that they think are fairly easy are actually not really possible. So having them working you know, side, side by side with these, with these uh, researchers, with the students, helps them to inform that. On the other side, it means that the students get to get a good understanding of the actual challenges of the field. This thing works in theory. I think it'd be really good for this. Oh, but no, but we have these other problems that you have to work around first, right? So it helps give them an appreciation for this, helps, helps give the students um, you know, a drive to actually solve these problems because they know that they're saving these responders' lives and now they're, these responders are also their friends. Now, of course, I've talked a lot about how we use these in competition. Of course, we also use these in the, uh, for, for, for the responders themselves. Here's how we can often set them up. And here we often divide these tests, these different tests into different suites of tests for different types of robots, because of course we realize that not every robot needs to go through every task. So for example, let's say ultra lightweight reconnaissance robots, right? These are robots where there's been a traffic accident and there's a tanker with some unknown something in it. You know, you want the first robot out downrange while they're getting the big robots out. They might even need, it might even be in a place that's inaccessible. They may even need to throw this robot over a wall and then have it run around. And that's where the RMRC robots are also really good. Yeah. Uh, one of the American teams last year, no, sorry, the year before that, basically had a chucker. And the idea was you wanted to be able to throw it up three stories, have it drop, and still be able to go admittedly through some of the competition. There might have been issues and walls of it ended up needing to be replaced with panels of duct tape. But it, in the finals, was able to do uh, practice runs and then finals runs of a meter and a half drop over and over and over. And it reliably kept going. And I could see everybody else going, Oh, and like cringing, actively cringing, even though it wasn't even their robot, because they were just, every time they expected it would land on a wall, it would land on its back, it would let on an edge. It's going to break. No, nope, it's fine. Keep throwing it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, you know, these are, again, different challenges that we push that are really re needed in the real world. Then we have, for example, the um, robots for that are package capable, that can inspect a suspicious package, right? A lot of these call outs to bomb squads are suspicious packages. Someone's left a suitcase on the platform. I mean, most of the time it's, you know, absent-minded professor, jet, jet, lag. jet lag, someone, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the mother who, or father who's dealing, with, who's dealing with, you know, dealing with children and they drop something and the train doors close, right? But they don't know that. So you need, a, you need to assume that there's something dangerous there until you've proven otherwise. So, of course, we have a different suite of tests. These aren't robots that you're necessarily throwing off the building, yeah. but these are ones that you need to deploy fairly quickly, get down range, maybe go up the stairs, uh, so on and so forth. And then, of course, you have the ones for suspicious vehicles, right? Not long ago here in DC, we had a situation where Dulles Airport was shut down because there was a white van just parked out there that no one seemed to have anything to do, and it ended up being fine. The problem is that the robot couldn't open the doors. They actually had to have a guy in a bomb suit walk up to the vehicle to open the door, walk past the robot to open the doors and then walk back and then the robot went in to do its thing. I mean, that, there's something wrong with that. So we yeah. need to have these tests in there to, ins to not only test the ability of these robots to do it, but also to, s to characterize how well or how poorly this is done and to inspire the next generation of robots and the next generation of research to build these capabilities that can actually save these lives. Now, of course, we don't just talk about this from the perspective of the robot manufacturers and the, the end users, right? We want to deploy these everywhere. I mean, every classroom, ideally, we want them, right? Yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having it. I mean, so if you saw those lanes, those little zigzags earlier, the idea is to have one of those set up and you can just, you know, put in different items. Do you want stairs? Cool, we can put in stairs. If you want 
Pinwheels, so you have some obstacles. Sure, let's do it. Hey, let's do the sand day. Okay, let's pop some walls on it, duct tape it so the sand doesn't go everywhere, and put some sand in and see how we do. So it takes up a small amount of space and it's pretty versatile. The larger one's a little harder. We're a big believer of duct tape, you may have, you may have noticed. <laughs> um, you know, we're a big believer of make the darn thing work, prove that you can make it work, and then you can refine it. Yeah. Now, of course, the same principle applies to the end users. We want the end users to be able to perform these tests, just like we want you know, every, um, uh, you know, every uh, um, young athlete, every school to be able to perform the same tests that the professionals do in their, in, in their training and whatever, right? The idea is firstly, they can see that the robots that they're getting from the manufacturer, you know, they, can, they can do the acceptance testing. But it also means that you can now use the same tests to train the operators, right? The manufacturer's expert was able to get this level of performance. I can only get to this in this test. What am I missing, right? And they can be specific now about it. I can do everything else, it's just this little bit I need to talk to someone or, hey, I can do this really well, but not this, but, you know, respond to Larry in the next squad over is the other way around. We need to talk and we need to figure out what each of us can do really well and can teach the others. Think of it like driving your car. So maybe you took a weekend course on how to drive. You took your driver's test, you passed, you bought a car and then you put it in your garage until there's an emergency and yeah. you never touch it. You never look at it. All of a sudden, somebody has appendicitis and you need to drive them to the hospital. So yeah. uh, what are you going to do? Uh, you've never pulled the car out. You've never put oil in the engine. You don't know where the gas cap is, let alone whether or not it has gas in it. Where are the keys? No clue. Uh, when was that time you took the test? Oh, that was like five years ago. Oh, no. What do you do now? Yeah, It's the same concept. You have to practice. You have to make sure everything's maintained. And you have to make sure that your hand-eye coordination is correct. And this isn't to say that these squads don't train. They do train, but the problem is, is that they tend to, especially with the drone operators, right? You, you say, you know, you need to get, you know, X number of flying hours, but they don't say for what. And invariably they're busy. They'll take them off, they'll fly them around a field and they'll land them. That's not really a test, but you, do, you need some kind of standard curriculum. So these test methods form these standard curriculums and they're being adopted all across the United States and Canada and all around the world. And one of the key points about this, just as in RMRC, where we have small, easily deployed systems, um, small, easily deployed apparatuses, is here we design them so that these apparatuses only take up one lane of, you know, say a parking garage, and they can swap out all kinds of different tests. So there's no excuse not to deploy these, no excuse not to test them. And it looks like, a, it looks like an advertisement for Home Depot, because we want all of these test apparatuses to be buildable by any free, but you know, you're using only bits you can get from a hardware store and a stationary store. You'd be surprised how tricky it is to do good statistically significant <laughs> measurement science under that constraint. That's one of the hard bits about this. Mm -hmm. Hence all the duct tape. Yeah, and we even designed it to be put into shipping containers so that you can have ready designed, ready made, um, you know, environmentally controlled facilities. In fact, this is actually how um, the facility was initially constructed at some of the uh, so, some of the some of our test sites in the Middle East, where we're, we're you know, where Department of State is, uh, is is making use of this. We even make them fit in tractor trailers so that you can move them around. A little bit easier around here. It also means that squads can trade them back and forth. So hey, I got the stairs this month. You've got the manipulations. Let's trade next month and practice again. Yeah, and of course these go all around the world. We've got test facilities spread across civilian and military, and in this case, a lot of nuclear, um, you know, all around. This is, this, this is actually a little bit out of date. We've actually got a few more sites now in Europe, a few more sites in, uh, in Korea and so on. Um, so this is truly an international effort. These standards are consensus standards. There are, we have involvement from people from all around the world, um, students and researchers and governments and manufacturers and end users. That's what make this, makes this really powerful. Everyone's on the, same, on the same board. So to summarize, okay, so these standard test methods focus development because they communicate these very real challenges from the application right through to what you can do in the classroom. The teams developed on abstract but relevant apparatuses. These are abstract enough that you can build them easily. You can understand it. When something goes wrong, you understand why it went wrong. 
real qualifications can be conducted remotely, just like you can get a coach to say, okay, well, what, what score did you get for this particular standard test? And there's no incentive to cheat because you can just recre recreate it. These combos, putting them together, reveal operationally significant capabilities. We have other events as well to encourage dissemination. We, of course, have these best in class because we measure individually all these capabilities. So you may not win the overall, but you're winning in a particular capability that is still very important and still pay, we still pay attention to. And because everything is the same, the winning student teams are now interesting to the first responders in industry who can use these as recruitment to figure out what capabilities are out there and get invitations to the next level. And at this point, we should probably start thinking about taking yep. some Q&A. Well, that's, well, we're almost, almost done here. So let's, cool. okay, and of course, you know, this is Boldercon, everyone's plugging books. So oh, I just wanted yeah, to uh, forget the books. Um, plug a book I actually put together many years ago. This is a photo book um, of a lot of the early response robots in a lot of our tests. Um, it's available from watchfromrobots.com. It's, you know, it's a nice photo book. Um, I've thrown a lot of URLs around, we'll, but um, you know, that's, that's our presentation. Um, there's a lot of URLs here. Don't worry too much about them. If you just go to um, boltacon.intelligentrobots.org, you'll see all these URLs. <laughs> okay, so that's it for the prepared remarks. We have some time for some Q&A. We have one here. Do you want to, Archer, do you want to, do you want to yeah, take it? Yeah, let me start off with that one. So, uh, what is the ratio of boys to girls? Assuming it's not 50-50, are you doing anything to encourage more girls to join? So that is a interesting issue. As a league, no, it is not 50-50, not yet, which is part of the reason why we're trying to reach out. Uh, we have currently, I think it's at least two schools that are boys only that take, yeah. you know, that, that are fairly large parts of the league. So that, that makes yeah. it a little bit more boy heavy. The flip side of that, though, is we actually have been doing outreach with two all girls schools also in Australia. So hopefully we get them on board and uh, we start balancing the ratios a little bit. Uh, a couple of the American teams are getting better with their balancing. Uh, one of the American teams has a uh, larger sis sister school from the, the local university and college are, are working together. Sorry, university and high school have gotten too used to working with Australians. <laughs> university and high school are working together. And so uh, some of the university students are actually mentoring the high school students and help in order to help them get along. And uh, last year we ended up having basically all of that uh, older team coming over and helping us with judging and just being encouragement and going around and helping kids deal with their things. And that team, uh, one of the uh, coaches, mentors is you know, woman and very much female power. Yes, awesome. And I've been talking with her a little bit about how to help encourage and, and make this a better thing, which is part of the reason why I've been inviting her over so that way people get used to the whole concept of, oh, my God, girls like robots too. <laughs> Uh, we had one team last year who was technically 100% female team members, but that was because we only had the one team member, which was kind of a shame, but I was impressed. Her robot the year before needed six people to run, and last year she got it running all by herself, and I was, I was just pleased as plush. All the good feels. So we have another question here. So if a school wanted to start a team, what's a ballpark on the startup cost, the yearly costs, and how many students minimum would you need to have interested for a viable team? This is actually kind of a tricky question. So, and actually this year, well, so this year RoboCup's been canceled because of COVID. We're actually going to be looking to run it online, just mm -hmm. like Balticon. So actually stay in touch because this, when it runs um, this later this year, hopefully we'll get it to run. Um, you know, it's going to be a much lower cost because you don't have the travel cost. This year was going to be held in Bordeaux in France, which would have been, you know, or who, no one wants to go, you know, it's, it's just too, 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 Expensive too much. Expensive wine, yeah. drinking, <laughs> yuck, but, cheese. Ugh. But the point is, is that um, the robots are deliberately very cheap. Like I said, we aim at $500. You can get started with the robot. Um, of course, you can go up from there. Um, and that's, I mean, that's assuming you have access to, uh, to some kind of 3D printer, even if it's a fairly low cost, like $200 printer. Um, a number of times a number of students. You can do this with one really, really interested student. In general, I mean, we seem to see maybe six students tend to be a good number. Yeah, I'd say um, three is your minimum because you're mm -hmm. going to want your operator, your software, and your hardware. 
uh, unless, again, like you're that one really awesome student from Mexico who could do it all by herself. Again, very proud. Uh, yeah, I'd say three is probably a good minimum because as a high school student, you also have to balance out work, life, play. Hmm. Being all things to all one job is difficult. Uh, it, as evidence, we have a team of techs. There's no way any one of us could do all of the tech and streaming that would makes Balticon run. We have to work together. <laughs> But it, it, it does vary a lot. Um, and if you have some specific things about that, of course, feel, feel free to get in touch and we can discuss further. Uh, we'll also be on the, uh, on, on the Discord um, right after this. Um, and so we can also continue the discussion. And on the Discord note, I'm going to stop our screen share so our lovely tech can share the, uh, Bal sorry, the Baltimore Balticon uh, address for our Discord. Yep. There we go. There we go. Okay, so, I mean, we're not there right now because we're still talking to you. Yes. Uh, but we'll be over there momentarily. There is a yeah. uh, active panels discussion section and uh, we'll be in the sex and time. Yeah. Tech and science section so that way you can come and ask us questions. On that note, uh, we had a comment actually in this chat. Um, yes, we did break, they did, they did break three because of course it's an approximation of 3.14, so they did break three mm -hmm. pies. They actually lost three before they figured out the whole I wanted a trophy thing. It was <laughs> embarrassing. I mean, awesome, but kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, I think, I think we're basically on time now. We need to give, uh, we need to give people time to, uh, to go off and do, do, do what they need to do before getting to the next presentation. So thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you for, for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of the con. Please sign up for lots of stuff. Show love to your panelists. And remember, of course, Baltacon is a volunteer run organization. There is no registration fee this year, but if you go onto the Baltacon website, please donate. There is actually a donation registration where you can get, where you can also get some t-shirt things and whatnots as well. So please do support Baltacon. Please do support the Baltimore Science Fiction Society. Please do. Thank you very much for joining. Bye.